So this idea of mine that I call the no turn cast um, started, I know the exact moment, uh, it was in 1993. I was the defending world long driving champion and I was playing in a, a corn ferry tour event. It's called the Nike tour in those days. And I gave a big clinic in front of the whole town of Boise, Idaho on, on Tuesday. And someone asked me how I hit it so far. And I'm like, well, I take as big a back wing, back swing as I can. And then I throw all the angles away as quickly as possible. And I go, you shouldn't do that. Right. Um, Cause I go, this is just my feel and what I do. It's not what actually happens. So I ended up playing pretty well in the tournament. I finished about 20th or something. And uh, um, David Duval was still on that tour at the time. Uh, he hadn't become famous yet. And he comes over to me, had a very brief discussion with him. And he goes, he basically said, you know, he's a quiet guy. He goes, you know what you said about throwing all the angles away? Yeah, I do that too. Great idea. Nice playing. And, you know, we shook hands and that was the end of it. So you know, I was still a player for, for quite a number of years after that and started to struggle. And then I went into teaching about 10 years ago. And the obsession with lag, with face on lag, never really meshed with me. I, I, I never got it. I, I, I thought it was a bad thing, but there wasn't a lot of data and research and everybody was really lag obsessed. So, um, People were trying to get it. Everybody's a caster. Everybody's a flipper. Nobody was getting shaft lean. And they're all doing that big float load motion, trying to get lag. And I go, you know, I have a theory. I'm going to approach this from an entirely different direction. So my theory was, is that when people were setting their wrists late, they were overextending their arm swing and it was going past the rotation of their body. And then when they were trying to hold the angles, it ruined the sequencing. So I said, you know what? Stand up there, set your wrist behind you, hinge your wrist behind you, and just throw it away as fast as you can. And it had some remarkable, remarkable results, almost, I mean, uh, almost universally. Um, people's pivots got better. They lined up their arms and their, their torso better. And they were actually getting more lag in Shaftley. So I said, you know what? I'm going to throw this on the internet. And I called it the no turn cast drill. Because it's like, you know what? This isn't what actually happens. It's a drill to help your sequencing. And what I found was, is that from like wedge through seven iron, it worked really well for pretty much everybody and worked for almost nobody past that. Didn't know why. Didn't fight it. Just... You know, I said, here's a little drill that'll help you link up and then just try to passively translate it to the longer clubs. So in the last five or six years, I started to see all of the experts and data collectors start to talk about risk data and risk graphs. Um, Chris Como, Sasha McKenzie, Phil Cheatham, John Sinclair, Joe Mayo, these guys all started talking about wrist movements um, and the data and the graphs. And I got really, really intrigued with when they started talking about getting the center of mass of the club behind the hands. And I said, you know what? This is really, really interesting. And as I studied the graphs, as I studied elite golfers, and as I started to experiment with it myself, I pretty much came to the conclusion that the face on lag is pretty much irrelevant. Um, there's never been a study that I've seen that equates um, more lag with more distance and better ball striking. You know, Sergio is always the poster child and Hogan as well going back in the day. But there, the, the, the down the line lag, um, getting the center of mass behind the club, uh, center mass of the club behind the hands without early right tilting the shoulders. I started to feel like that was the key, um, the key thing. And when people were doing that wide to narrow float loading motion, it was throwing their sequences off, their pivots were getting all messed up. Whereas when I started to get people to 
get the center of mass behind the club and what we now know is ulnar deviation, I started to see that th their bodies had to react better. Um, if you ulnar deviate the club behind your hands in transition, if your body doesn't shift and your pressure doesn't shift correctly and you don't pivot correctly, you're going to stick the club in the ground. So it's put me on a path where instead of getting the body to move and make that put the club in position, I went to more of a let's get the club center of mass and face in position and have the body react. So the rest of it started to turn into, I really, really started to see how ulnar deviation and flexion would pair and then how radial deviation and extension would pair throughout the swing. Now, you know, nothing's, everybody knows nothing's universal, but I saw a lot of pairing of those movements. So I said, well, now it makes sense. When people are float loading, they're getting a ton of early downswing extension in their left wrist. And as Brian was talking about, if you go, you know, here, 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 it's, it's, it's a no go. All right. Um, whereas if I got people ulnar deviating, it made flexing the left wrist really easy in transition. And everybody would say, well, Monty, you know, I don't want to be a caster. I want to lag the club. And with the hack motion sensor, I was able to show them that they actually lagged the club more. And with the launch monitor, all of, not just club head speed and distance, but all of the launch conditions um, started improving. So the issue that I think that we face with the face on lag and that that 2D still left arm parallel where, you know, Sergio and Hogan are super lagged, we're zeroing out one force being applied to the club. The, the force that the wrists and the hands couple are putting on the center of mass of the club. We're trying to zero that out. And there are so many forces being applied, um, vertical, lateral, and rotational uh, of the body, to just name a few. But there are many, many forces being applied. And um, zeroing out that, that one force just doesn't play. Um, and then, you know, everybody always likes to state the exception. Well, you know, Gary Woodland has a big down cock and a big uh, extension of the left wrist, and he's pretty good. But um, using the outliers to prove a point that it's okay for amateurs to do it kind of, you know, isn't the point. And um, uh, Scott Cowix gave a great presentation during this a seminar last year where he said, yes, there is a down cocking release pattern in tour players. And he pretty much was very diplomatic about saying that, you know, that's not going to work for club golfers um, because they're just going to, you know, when they down cock, they're going to extend that wrist. And we know you need to get back into flexion and then extension through impact. So that's just a lot for people to do. So I just started to discover that if I would just get people to, you know, ulnar deviate and that made it easier for them to flex and then their body would respond. And the, you know, the secondary part of that is everybody, like Brian said, trying to force that shaft lean and that bowed left wristed impact, you know, flexion pairs with ulnar deviation now, all of a sudden, when you're trying to flex your left wrist into impact, people would raise their handle a bunch. They'd early extend their pelvis uh, and thrust their early extend and thrust their pelvis. And we all know that's no good. So, you know, after going through all these kind of experiences on the lesson T experiences with my own game, seeing the data, seeing the risk graphs, trial and error, mostly tried on myself. I came up with, you know, the concept that I have today, which I just call the no turn cast. All right. And what I've tried to do is make the golf swing super, super simple. And this concept has worked, has worked with 
you know, tour former tour players, um, other great instructors, um, players of every skill level, all the way up to beginner. So here's kind of, uh, you know, a bare bones idea of my concept that I think simplifies it for everybody is, you know, uh, in the backswing, this isn't always necessary. We see a lot of good players with good backswings, but the, I see an overwhelming number of people on my lesson tee that their arms overrun their pivots in the backswing, and then they just never recover no matter what they do. So my idea was, is that people perceive extra arm swing as more pivot or more rotation in the backswing. And when they're not hinging their wrist correctly, because they were told to have a one piece takeaway and take the hands out of it and all that stuff, they set the club very, very late. The brain responds by extending the backswing way too far. And then they set at the top or on the way down, get their left wrist extended, it's a mess. So I said, okay, concept A of this, just hinge your wrists, radial deviate, to use the technical term. Just hinge your wrist somewhere behind you, all right? And don't feel like you turn at all. And almost without exception, all of the people with long disjointed backswings made a very, very nice full backswing when they tried not to turn at all and just reacted to the wrist set, to hinging the wrist to a radial deviating. So that kind of took care of the disjointed backswings. Then I said, okay, the downswing is all a reaction because, you know, plus or minus a downswing takes two tenths of a second and a human motor function plus or minus takes 25 hundredths of a second. So if you're trying to make moves in the downswing, it's happening after the ball is gone. So we need to have these movements as a reaction. So in physics, elementary physics, every action equal and opposite reaction. So I discovered that if I told people to cast it on purpose, they actually held those angles longer as a reaction and the body would pivot as a reaction. So we got to the problem of, well, Monty, what about all the people that actually do cast? And I said, well, I need to look at that. So all of those motions tended to be, this is a gross oversimplification, but casting in the wrong direction, so to speak. Um, so if we're on a clock, all right, and the target is 12 o'clock and a down the line camera is six o'clock, the bad casters, the high handicappers, the over the top slicers, they're all casting toward four and five o'clock. That's the motion that nobody wants, the weak, the weak unloading of the wrist early. So I said, okay, just do that same casting motion that you hate so much, but do it toward eight o'clock, do it behind you. But you can't cheat and do it by right tilting your shoulders early. It has to be a wrist motion. And the benefit of having the hack motion is, is that motion almost immediately turned into a high skill level player looking graph. And the happy coincidence was, is when they started trying to cast it toward that eight o'clock position, they started bringing the lead wrist this way instead of that way. So since ulnar deviation and flexion kind of couple, I just saw a lot of people when they tried to throw it that way, they'd get that nice clean graph and some early flexion in the left wrist, either toward the end of the backswing or early in the downswing. So, you know, I call in, in, in my description, in my instructional video, when I talk about this, I call that cast A, all right? And, you know, just basically throw it to eight o'clock without tilting your shoulders. And then I have a discussion where I call cast B. And that has to be a little more reactive. 
And this is something that Brian was talking about is, you know, you don't want to hold that flexion all the way through impact. Um, you want to see that extending of the wrist coming into impact and through impact. That's why you want the flexion to happen fairly early in the downswing, which you can't have if you're down cocking because you won't get that early flexion. If you don't get the early flexion, you can't have the nice extension of the wrist as you're hitting through impact. And this always say, well, but, but you know, I, always, I get a lot of but Monty's when I talk about this, but Monty, you're supposed to have a flat or a bowed left wrist at impact. I go, yeah, I get it. That's why you've got to create some so you can unload it. And it's unloading, but it doesn't completely unload. So you kind of go from here to there. And the proof that I can offer when that you should be having the wrist extending as you're coming into impact is if the left arm is decelerating and that accelerates the club. If the left arm is decelerating and the club is accelerating, by definition, the lead wrist has to be moving this way. Okay. But like I said, this is a feel. And we're, if you're trying to do this at impact, you're zeroing out one force when there are multiple forces um, being applied. So this concept that I have, you know, I looked at the graphs and I say, in general, a club player would benefit greatly if they got some radial deviation in the backswing without too much extension. And if their intent is to start the downswing by immediately on their deviating toward that eight o'clock position and then understanding around P6-ish, you know, shaft parallel to the ground, the left wrist is going to start moving in this direction. I got a lot of great results. Um, better impact conditions on the launch monitors, higher club head speeds, better dispersion, all that good stuff, less wrist pain, and less pain in the elbows. Um, I've had people who are wearing those those uh, braces around their forearms to um, you know to protect their golfers and tennis elbow. As soon as they started working into these concepts, they the pain went away, or at least got to a point where they could they could stomach it and do okay. So it's you know I'm not sitting here saying this is what happens in a good swing. I'm saying. If they have this intent, it really, really evens out their wrist graphs, all right? So um, I'm not gonna babble on too much about this, but th the key here, the key common fact here is, and everything else that I discuss is to get this one thing right, all right? Is getting the center of mass behind your hands from a down the line angle without going into right tilt early. So everybody makes fun of Alex Noren's rehearsal, you know, uh, drill that he does. But in my opinion, he's smarter than all of us because that's exactly what he's doing there. He's staying in left tilt and moving the center of mass behind his hands. So to me, that is, if we can get, you know, Brian talked about the, you know, flex and extend. And I'm kind of saying the same thing in a different way. I'm saying that if you own their deviate to eight and get the center of mass behind you, that will flex and you'll be forced to pivot and extend correctly from that position. Um, and, um, you know, the two real world examples we have of this that everybody can have available to them and not just taking my word for it, is there's a, a video of Bryson DeChambeau. I believe it was before the US Open, but it might have been right after. I, I apologize for not knowing exactly when it was filmed, but I put it on my social media and he is absolutely 
talking about and demonstrating ulnar deviating the center of mass behind his hands to start the downswing and then pivoting the club into the ball as a reaction. So um, it's, a, it's a really, really great demonstration of what my ideas are in my head. And then um, <clears throat> some of you may or may not know this, but Stan Utley just, I don't, cured it might be too strong of a word, but he just really, really helped out Charles Barkley get rid of his swing yips, who for years, he used to have a really good swing. I played with him in probably 1990. He had a good golf swing. He probably shot 80, good player. Um, and he went the lag route and that's how he got his swing yips. And Stan just said, listen, you got to unload the vertical hinge first move down. And he's had a lot of immediate success with that. So um, the last couple of things I'm going to say here, you know, just briefly about, you know, the extension of the left wrist through impact, you know, uh, they just showed Tiger's son. And if you watch DJ, when they exit, they're like this, very extended left wrist, very uh, flexed right wrist for a right-handed golfer. That club didn't, that, those wrists didn't get there overnight. That is a gradual unloading of that angle through impact. So, you know, what I've tried to demonstrate here is the two angles that we've been told we need to hold on to, the vertical hinge and the horizontal hinge, I think we just need to dump them and unload them um, as quickly as possible. We have uh, some questions here. First of all, what do you say to players who can go into flexion on the downswing and milliseconds later, more radial? Just your thoughts. Um, this is what I say to anybody that can get it done. If you can get it done, I'm not going to change it. But the number of people that can do that is so I haven't seen one yet. I'll, let me put it, I give, you know, thousands of lessons a year in person and online, and I've yet to see someone who can manage that and not have a really, really bad dispersion pattern. Um, I never say it's impossible. I just think it's extremely difficult. I never talk in terms of right and wrong. Um, obviously, there's a lot of ways to get things done. My discussion is always, What's easier? What's the path of least resistance? Mm -hmm. Okay, good answer. Uh, then there's a question about, can you explain the eight o'clock position again? Uh, sure. So if you can picture that you're looking from above and, you're, and the golfer and the golf ball are in the middle of the clock and the, the target is 12 o'clock, and if we had a down the line camera, the down the line camera is at six o'clock. So the eight o'clock throw would be behind the golfer. So it's di directly behind. Well, nine o'clock would be directly behind. Mm -hmm. That's, right. I've had to tell people try and do that just to get the concept through. But in reality, eight mm -hmm. o'clock, between seven and eight o'clock is, is kind of the, the range where you see it done correctly. All right. Then there is a question. Uh, where do you prefer to see the hands exit after impact with cost B? That's a great question. Um, so this is, this is, um, I haven't done a lot of, you know, data observation on this yet. Um, like I said, I'm waiting for the experts to do it. But when I find that when golfers allow that extension to happen, even if they're not getting the impact quite the way they want to, um, the rate of closure on the club seems to go down. And there's not as much on the hack motion, we don't see as much face rotation. Um, and the body pivots better. And I always say where the, anything that happens after transition is a, um, a function of what's happening. But if people aren't holding that, that flex left wrist angle, the hands tend to exit left much better and have less, you know, arms separating out away and far right paths and big hand rolls uh, after impact. 
Right. We have a question. So is it good to extend left wrist just before impact? Yeah. See, I don't like that at all. This is why I don't like the down cocking motion. Like Gary Woodland is a fan. Obviously the guy won a a U.S. Open. He could beat me with three clubs. But that down cocking its extension, going in the flexion, and then trying to extend again. You know, uh, Daniel Berger is quite successful with going into flexion and continuing to add flexion through impact. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I just, I tend to see that most golfers, even highly skilled golfers, the the motion they have the easiest time with is a little bit of extension at the top from radial deviating, some ulnar deviation and some flexion and transition. And then right around shaft parallel, the left wrist starts to extend and pretty much ends neutral pretty neutral at impact. Um, That's where I see the most success of added club head speed and more importantly, solid contact, good impact dynamics and dispersion. There's a question about uh, does the throw at eight differ between short and long clubs, six iron versus nine iron? Okay, that's a great question. In reality, yes. So like I said, there's always gotta be two discussions here. In reality, there's a significant difference, but from an intent, the golfer's intent, it's exactly the same. All right. And then there's a question about uh, early extension of the lead wrist at impact uh, would be, would result in a scoop and added loft. Yes. So yes. optimize impact in the full swing. Are we trying to get to flat or slightly extended? That's, that's going to be a function of a lot of things. I mean, Someone that's swinging 120 miles an hour with a driver, so let's say 100 miles an hour with a six iron, they're going to have a lot more success with a flat or even slightly flexed wrist at impact. But if you've got someone who's only 80 miles an hour with the driver and, you know, the requisite seven iron, if they're flat or flexed at impact, they're not going to put enough spin on that ball and it's not going to get in the air. So club head speed has a lot to do with what's the optimum wrist angle at impact. So obviously DJ, he swings 125, 130 miles an hour. He can be in there like this and he can still get the ball airborne. Um, a 60 year old club golfer who's you know hitting seven iron 130 yards if he's not a little bit extended at impact, that ball's not going to get in the air. And then there's a question uh, from Michael. As a, as a long ball hitter, what is the best way to increase club head speed? Another good question. Um, so there are gains to be made from being more fit, um, uh, speed training. Those things absolutely will help. But there's no substitute for making your golf swing more efficient. Um, When I was the world long driving champion, I was six foot two, 190 pounds. And I was beating people in the 220 to 300 pound range, six foot six, six foot eight monsters, you know, like the guys you see today. And so um, the fitness training would have probably helped me a little bit, but, um, I have people coming to me all of the time that are extremely fit um, and that have done the speed protocols with, uh, you know, Mach 3 or, or one of the other companies, and they are just not, you know, achieving very much speed. But when we improve their sequencing, see, that's where speed comes from. Speed doesn't come from the hips firing. Speed doesn't come from the torso firing. Speed comes from proper sequencing and proper loading and unloading of the wrist. That's why the hack motion sensor is so important because this is measuring where the greatest speed producer is, which is the proper loading and unloading of the wrist. I was measured by biomechanical experts in the mid nineties who couldn't understand why a guy who had no muscle at all hit it past everybody. And they discovered that my impact dynamics 
were different than anything they had ever seen. And that's where most of my speed came from. And that's kind of what put me on the road to looking at the importance of proper wrist action in club head speed versus firing the hips and torso really fast. All right, then we have question. Can you cast too far behind you if you do not tilt your shoulders? I guess it's possible. I haven't seen it yet. Um, the only time I see too far behind you is if the shoulders um, come out of left tilt early. Um, I, you know, anything, anything is possible, but I'll say it's unlikely that you can actually move your wrists and get the club too far behind you if you're, you know, if your tilts are in our correct alignment. Then we have a question of uh, does virtual clock face become more elliptical the shorter the club is? Yeah, that was that kind of. I'm going to give kind of the same answer that I gave to the other person. Is it different between the clubs? Absolutely. The shape of the clock absolutely changes with the length of the club and the ball position and the distance from the ball. The the clock is nothing more than a visual. It's not reality. It's like. You know, you'll see this map is not to scale. Um, it's just a visual for the golfer to have a different intent about the direction of the center of mass of the club. Because we've seen that, you know, the golfer's instinct is to bring the center of mass of the club straight down into the ball. And that's where we get the steep, over the top, vertical shaft, extended wrist, all that nasty stuff. And we know that plus or minus the center mass of the club goes up away from the ball and away from the target as it changes direction. And that eight o'clock visual kind of helps all three of those things happen. Right. And then uh, last question. Uh, you mentioned that the idea didn't work as well with driver and three wood. Why is that when compared to short irons? Okay. That was my original, just, just generally unload all the angles. That was my eight year ago video drill that I put on the internet where it didn't work with longer clubs. But as I studied the data and what is actually happening and what some of the experts are saying, once the idea of getting the center of mass behind the hands kind of became clear to me, then it works. Now it works with every club. I uh, really appreciate your time. Very excellent presentation. And it's one, one of the things for me, the great is that I, hear it from a person who's actually hitting the ball a long way that uh, you know that uh, it's not somebody who's teaching you who maybe has theoretical knowledge but actually actually very uh, practical knowledge of how to generate speed so well there's there's two things i'll leave you with this there are two things that help my credibility one that i hit it far even as an old fat man i still hit it far and not to patronize you but having the wrist sensor and having the graphs and the graphs of elite players and proving that these ideas per, per, you know, um, produce correct motions, that gives the, the ideas credibility as well. So thank you.